Today, we're going to talk about uh, building PowerShell applications that operate on a planetary scale. Uh, so I'm Justin Sider. I'm the CIO of Belay Technologies. It's just a title. What I really do is uh, use PowerShell every day. Um, I consider myself more of a consumer of PowerShell, PowerShell than uh, some of the uh, older guys here, I don't, uh, more senior guys. Uh, who are going to get down to the nuts and bolts. I'm really just going to consume uh, what the PowerShell team is going to deliver and uh, what other community uh, members deliver. Um, so uh, let's see what we got. All right, quick agenda. Going to review my thoughts on uh, the evol uh, our evolution of working with PowerShell. It's like seven-ish stages uh, represented by the, the kind of caveman thing going on. I'm going to review my problem that I have every day and then uh, talk about the solution. We'll do a demo. If you have a laptop, I can take about 30 volunteers today. Um, and we'll see, uh, kind of see how that goes, try something different. Um, and then hopefully it turns into a discussion. I, I hope that you don't actually want to sit up here and listen to me for an hour and a half. Um, I want to hear from you guys too. All right, stage one. Uh, also keep in mind that the, my primary background has been uh, coming in through, to PowerShell through VMware. Um, I don't do a lot with Active Directory, Exchange, uh, a lot of what the you know, Windows administrator tool set's going to be. Not that I've never done it, but it's not my primary role. I'm really using it as a, a, a platform to program uh, software that helps me manage environments, whether it be VMware or uh, our Java application I do on a daily basis. Um, so stage one, you, know, you start learning PowerShell, you're going to do uh, Simple commands, right? Git VM, uh, shut down VM guest. You're gonna, you know, maybe use a parameter, maybe you don't. Um, pretty basic stuff. Stage two, we start walking a little bit, and we're gonna use Git help, right? You're gonna learn how to use the functions, what's available. Um, you know, you have to be admin to kind of get help, but that's a different story. It's gonna be fixed. All right, pipeline. So. You know, these are probably what PowerShell is most famous for, I would say. Um, I can see like Jeffrey Snover up on stage saying, you get a pipeline, and you get a one-liner, and you get a one-liner. Um, but, but this is really where the magic happens for you know, combining all the information together and really delivering a solution that uh, is gonna work well for us. All right, stage four, running a script. Most likely the first time you run a script is because someone else wrote it, right? You download it from the internet, uh, you reviewed it with your uh, awesome knowledge, and uh, you trust that that person isn't going to break your environment. So uh, has, has anyone just ran a script and not really cared what it did? Wow. Yeah. So I have two. I, I mean, at the beginning of you know, your experience, you're like, I mean, this looks good, right? Whether or not they've typed out the commands or whether they haven't, you, you know, you're just... They're going off of aliases, and maybe it was an alias that they had local in their box, or maybe it was, I don't even know. Uh, I, I don't recommend to do that. Do your research. All right, so stage five and six, uh, and you'll see it on the next slide. I'm not really sure which one comes first. So you have writing your own script, and then stage uh, six would be you know, sourcing files, right? So I, any feedback on what, what you guys kind of think would come first? I don't know. Okay. And how many folks source files? Okay. And do you feel like that's a better or worse, I don't want to say worse, more advantageous uh, than modules, right? Where do you see the advantage being? Modules or sourcing? Yeah, it really depends on what you're doing. Okay. All right, I, I mean, I tend to lean towards modules. Um, it can be overkill, right, depending upon the amount of work you want to do. Um, but I think sourcing has its advantages. Modules, of course, comes next. Um, there's a lot to it. Uh, you know, one of the talks I'm looking forward to later this week is going to be uh, building your own repository. Uh, a lot of the work I do is in a lab environment, so I don't have uh, internet access. So I can't get things from the PowerShell gallery, right? So I'm constantly taking modules and moving them to different boxes um, and hopefully getting them in the correct directory. 
um, which is pretty simple because I kind of log in as administrator everywhere and run everything from the, the root PowerShell module directory. So um, sorry about that. All right. So the whole presentation is about you know, operating stuff on a planetary scale. And, and the reason I'm up here is because I hate the current solutions that are out there today. I haven't been able to find anything that, that actually works for me. So there's things like Nagios, there's things like SolarWinds, uh, there's, you know, uh, name some more tools that you use that, that like capture a piece of what you want to do, but, you know, you know Nagios, for instance, right, I, I can monitor all the things in, in my environment, right? I have probably 2,300 checks right now. The issue I have is that something turns yellow or something turns red, what do you have to do? You have to like figure out what that problem is, right, and then solve it. What I want to be able to do and what, what I need my, my younger guys or less experienced guys is just fix it, right? I just want a button. I want not just to have a button that says, like, resolve, right? Fix this thing. Um, but I'm not up here trying to, like, sell you, as a, sell you a GUI. I want you to be clear on that. Um, you're going to see a lot of GUI-ish type of things, but it's really the code underneath that, and that's the reason why I'm here, okay? So this slide came up uh, yesterday, and uh, sorry, I was off to the side. I couldn't really get a picture of it. Um, but like, you need to be here, right? Right where, I can't reach. Uh, right where it says Microsoft Azure. So that's where I, I need something to sit. I need something that can touch all of these different pieces, but I don't actually use that product. So um, it's great that they offer that, but I can't use it. So um, configuration management is important, automation and scripting, <coughs> monitoring to a certain degree, right? I mean, Nagios is great, but it really wants ones or zeros to give it the color. Uh, anybody use Nagios? Something similar? Wow, nobody? All right, well, I guess I need to move on to something else. <laughs> you seem excited about it. Okay. Um, so writing plugins for Nagios is a pain in the ass. So it, it really just wants to display color based on a zero, one, I think maybe a two. So every plugin you write has to you know, be deterministic. And when you get into the thousands of checks, uh, Nagios doesn't really want to run a whole lot. So I think we have like 34 cores or 32 cores and 64 gigs of RAM on our Nagios server to kind of give us the picture of what's going on. But it's really individual pictures, right? So it doesn't tell you the story of is production available or it's just telling you whether something's up or down. It can ping it, you know, it gets a one or a zero on, based on a service is running. Um, so the single pane of glass, I, I, does anyone know if it exists? I mean, we sat through lunch yesterday where somebody was trying to sell you something. Is he in the room? Um, and it sounds really cool. Uh, you know, my question with that is, what do you do with all the stuff you have now? I mean, you, you're under contract most likely with, with different vendors to to, for each of these pieces, right? So a, a solution like Tanium, I mean, do you just throw all of those things away? I don't, I don't know. I probably have more questions than answers on that. <laughs> Not the job I want. All right, so writing applications. Um, the way that I solve all this is, is, or started to solve all this, is I start writing applications, right? Things that can do all of those things for me, my way. Um, and I'll go through kind of, you know, the problems I had along the way, and then we'll, we'll get into to seeing some of, of, of what I've done. Um, scripts are cool. They work. Modules are cool. They work. Uh, the issue is, you know, when you have an environment like this uh, or an environment that, that spans the globe, you have to make sure that all of those scripts, all of those modules are in the same place at the same time. Um, so you need a management plane that's serving your management plane, right? Does that make sense? So um, that is included in, in what I work on. Um, applications can run 24-7. You don't have to actually have somebody there to actually kick off the script. Um, so they're, they're constantly monitoring. They're constantly running. They're giving you feedback. You can see things. Um, there's logging. I'll talk about logging and how I despise logging. And the most important thing for applications is that you really want a single system of record. Um, and this is a trap that I fell into uh, and I'm still trying to recover from. Uh, you can easily stand up a, 
you know, a, a service or a project in Germany. And this is my Germany VMware configuration management tool. Um, that's great for Germany. But then you come over here and you, you set up one in the US and it, and it works. But then you start moving assets, you start moving workloads, and, and now your configuration management is off because you've moved the workloads. And the Germany site doesn't know about anything from the, the US site, and the US site is, is vice versa. So now you're getting conflicting information back on config management. So a single system record is, is going to be the best. Um, access by the entire team at the same time. So uh, one of the things I looked at was you know, using PowerShell Studio to build uh, PowerShell UIs. Um, and if, if I was the only person on my team, I think it would be great. But the problem is I have to share it with the person that sits next to me and the person that sits next to him. And we're most likely not gonna see the same data at the same time. So I kind of threw that out the window and I don't even think I ever really got started on it. Um, I like the idea. And then uh, saying I write applications is kind of cool. Uh, the, the developers of the project I actually support don't really think I'm a developer. So, um, and then uh, there's a lot of tools out there that do uh, like export to Excel. Um, and I think that is probably the worst solution ever. Um, and even uh, delivering HTML files, right? Because the problem is they're static files, they don't get updated, right? They gotta pull some data from somewhere, right? So you really need uh, a web application backend that's gonna deliver real-time data. Um, and that real-time data is, is based on the input from the application, the PowerShell that's running out there. Um, and then, you know, sorting, filtering, retrievable history based on how long you want to keep stuff. I want to take action, uh, potentially deliver reports, email, send stuff to chat. Um, there's a lot of different options out there based on your environment itself. Um, so I would, you know, explore those different options. All right. So here's how I kind of go about solving the situation, right? So I have a, a central location for a database. Um, you know, I, is, are people familiar with like database schemas, uh, foreign keys, all those things? Like this is probably the most important thing I've ever learned as an administrator or engineer or anything like that. It's, it's so valuable. If you haven't done it, you need to do it. I don't care if you set up MySQL on your, on your local machine and just start storing information and learning how to manipulate data. Um, so as far as a single system of record and, and maintaining uh, a piece of information once and linking to that, you will greatly cut down on your amount of administration. Um, so, so each of these guys are individual components. They can pretty much sit anywhere on a, on a network that, that you can reach uh, the database. Um, and it's all talking rest in between the different components. So uh, for, for today's stuff, uh, there's no SSL. So um, the, I have a, a slide on security um, I think everybody will love. Um, and each of these guys perform their own tasks, right? The web, it's simple. It's just serving up web pages, right? It's PHP. Uh, PHP is very similar in my mind to PowerShell. So it's kind of like an easy transition, easy understanding. Um, the queue manager, pretty simple. It's managing a queue of tasks, right? So um, I don't care if it's to reboot a machine, if it's to collect information, if it's to update the database for whatever it is that you need updated. Um, there's gonna be submitted task, he'll go through and he'll assign it to a proper area where it can be actually worked. Uh, the W man is a workflow manager. He's performing the, the stuff, he's doing the work. Um, one of the confusing things when you start looking at like my data model is you can have multiple queue managers and you can have one through N uh, workflow managers. And that's basically to kind of separate um, by geographic location or to separate by task type. So uh, maybe you have some Linux stuff and you, know, you, don't, you wanna be able to separate uh, your scripts. So you can do that by basically tagging the, the tasks as, you, as they come in. Um, Scheduled tasks, uh, how many people use scheduled tasks on Windows? How many people like it, right? I mean, if that machine goes away, you have to remember that there were scheduled tasks on it, so I pull that out of Windows, and now I'm basically running it as a service, or, well, I wanna run it as a service. You'll see the status on some of these, some of these guys coming up. Um, and I, I think alerts kind of speaks for itself. 
and then future. I don't know. I don't know what else uh, I need right now. Um, so, but it's going to be a restful service. Whatever comes up, it's going to be a restful service, right? That's where everybody's moving to. Is this thing on too? All right. I don't really want to talk about security because I think we could go down a rabbit hole for a couple hours on that. Um, so it's your environment. You secure things the way that you need to secure it. I'm going to tell you it's REST. Uh, you know, my web server is Apache. So I, I think that, you know, you would have to apply whatever uh, environmental security controls you would want to do. Um, and you can do it individually for each component based on what your requirements are. Um, I work in a lab, so I don't really care about security most of the time. That's why I love my job. All right, so how it works, uh, again, everything's going over HTTP, HTTPS. Uh, it's basically going to request information from the database, and then it has an instruction set on what to do with that data, and it can reach out to a target, it can reach out to multiple targets. It really depends on, on how you write your script, right? The, the whole idea is that it's a, a pluggable thing, so you're going to, you know, Take your existing script that, it, that has in your environment, and when you submit a task, you're gonna submit it with some arguments. Um, the workflow manager will take that, run the script with your arguments, and it's gonna return back information. So that would include logging and basically a pass or fail or you know, some type of system-related uh, error. Hopefully that doesn't happen too much. Um, talked about that. I know what you're probably, yeah, uh, another framework. Who's excited about that? Yeah, sorry. Um, it, it's, it's just a way to manage your infrastructure a little bit differently. I mean, that's what I'm really going for. All right, struggles. Uh, you know, these are the things that I work through on a, on a daily basis with, the, with what I'm working on. Um, the first thing was, you know, I, not only was I spanning the globe trying to write these things, um, I, I had multiple, right? So I had something to do my VMware stuff. I had something to, uh, to manage users and groups from AD uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't want a junior guy logging into uh, my AD server, but I'm in a lab, so I don't really have, like, enterprise-level software. Um, a uh, solution for uh, VMware configuration management, and all of these were their separate stack. Um, so if something went wrong, I, you know, I would have to go specific to that stack. So uh, this, this new project that, I, that I'm putting out there is, is kind of to suck all of that in and take all that into consideration, to, to spread that workload out, but have that single system of record. Um, I bring up security again, uh, JSON web tokens, who likes those? Yep, no hands, exactly. Um, you know, the issue is that when you're talking about like a workflow manager or something performing tasks, you always have to make sure that you can authenticate to whatever it is you're trying to get. So if it's a REST call or, you know, maintaining those tokens is, is a pain in the butt. Maintaining credentials is a pain in the butt. Um, but you're going to have to do it either way. Um, in developing what I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, going from an individual stack that had a single purpose was easy. But as... You know, you try to take into consideration uh, multiple tasks, multiple classes of tasks. Uh, I would think that I was at a point where, man, this thing's good. I'm ready to go. And then you, know, you find three more problems. Um, and I think one of the issues is I defined my data model, wrote some of the PHP, took about a month break, and then came back in and tried to write the PowerShell. Um, and I have plenty of issues to... Uh, put back in some stuff that I just completely glazed over. Um, monitoring and monitoring tools. So uh, how do you check for this? Uh, you know, Nagios is a, a, a single check. So if I, if I have a machine out there, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to list the machine five times with five different endpoints, um, five different services. So I don't know that I figured out a model where I can get a good, good grasp of, you know, when I deploy this out, um, are my endpoints up? Is the system running? So it's kind of the, the same issues that you're going to run into with any application out there. Uh, documentation. I don't have a lot of it. It's in the code. <laughs> um, and then, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this, and uh, we were, I was talking to a couple guys last night at dinner, is because my younger guys don't grasp running scripts. They don't grasp 
uh, how to solve problems on, a, on an enterprise level. They've come from desktop support um, and you know, they just want to replace a box. It doesn't always work that way. So you know, I struggle with you know, how do I teach them PowerShell? How do I get them excited to use it and not frustrated? Um, so I, I will gladly take any suggestions on that. Um, additionally, um, in running the, the systems that I'm running, how do I teach them how to start it back up, right? You know, I'm, I'm an East Coast person, so if it goes down today, I was either asleep or, you know, our hours are so off, how do I, how do I explain to them to, to get my service back up and running? Um, and, and I think that's true of probably any solution that you're gonna work on. Things that didn't work, um, for, for logging, this, any solution you have can be overkill with logs, right? So trying to log to a centralized solution sucks because everything has to have read access, write access to that directory. Um, so I experimented with sending REST messages. So I just send a REST message, put it into a table. Um, I could classify it with high, medium, low. Um, I had an outage and uh, my script continued to go and threw like 12,000 rows into this database um, and I couldn't access the database anymore. So, uh, like, trying to take the things into consideration, it's like, you know, how much login is enough, but I don't want to uh, put too much login in there. Um, so I ended up writing a, or expanding on my uh, PowerShell login module to basically allow me to flip on and off different versions. So it's kind of like taking the log for J, so I can do debug, trace, uh, error, console only. Um, so I can kind of save myself, you know, parsing through some stuff, and I'll classify each of my log messages. Um, memory. Uh, running PowerShell on Windows can sometimes be memory intensive. Uh, I have one project, um, and I'm going to beat up VMware a little bit. Uh, I, would, I have like 40 different vCenters I log into uh, or, or need to maintain. And about every five minutes, I'll go out and check uh, something. Specifically, we're looking at NSX. So um, every five minutes, I need to go hit all of my vCenters, make sure that the vCenter and the NSX manager are in sync with their primary. Um, there's no amount of scripting that's going to take into account uh, PowerCLI doesn't want me to log in today. So what I did is I set up 40 different PowerShell processes that always have an open session to a vCenter. And I just hit that PowerShell sh session with a, uh, that set up a REST endpoint, and I get any information from the uh, vCenter I want. The issue is when you start doing like Git VM and you're getting a bunch of information from the vCenters, uh, the memory for each of those 40 sessions uh, starts to really creep up. So I had to implement a, uh, another REST endpoint that would monitor the memory and restart the endpoints whenever we reach you know, 70, 70, 80%. And keep in mind that's like a 48 uh, gig machine, or 48 gigs of RAM, so that's always fun. Uh, I thought one idea that I had was uh, to use VMware tools to kind of do remote, remote administration. Um, remember, I didn't, I didn't really, I don't really do Windows remoting and stuff, like, because um, I'm not really managing Windows machines or machines on a domain. I'm, I'm managing other services in my infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, so uh, for the VMware tools piece, yeah. so I'm talking about, yes, so I have a machine uh, sitting on a vCenter or a blade, and I would use uh, uh, VMware tools to actually execute something on box. Okay. Um, and again, it's, it's like a permission issue, right, because they're not joined to domain. So I have to have execution, and we're talking Windows, Linux, kind of stuff. So it, it didn't really work. Um, it was just slow, just slow. So REST endpoint. So I put a REST endpoint on the machine. I can hit the REST endpoint, execute the script, get a return back, super fast. Um, I talked about the different, uh, di uh, different solutions. I can run through a couple of them here that I have. Um, and then the other thing I did was uh, direct access. So I have a, a MySQL uh, module for PowerShell. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just, you know, when I'm spinning up my process, I can just use that module, connect to the database, get the information. Um, but 
it doesn't handle closing and disposing of uh, their sessions very well, um, even when you do it. So uh, it would, MySQL is maintaining the connection and then you get to a point where you can no longer make any more connections. So back to REST and I let REST handle all that stuff. All right, so the project uh, itself is a parent project. It's called Pembroke PS. Uh, it's, it's fairly robust. It's still new. Uh, it's customizable. It's scalable. Um, there's really no limits on, on how horizontal it can scale. I'm not talking about uh, vertical scaling. Uh, vertical scaling is where you're going to get into resource issues. Um, it's RESTful. Again, security. All these different components. There are going to be subcomponents. Um, you can secure them however you need to inside your environment. Um, everything's in the PowerShell gallery, ready to go. All right, here are the different components I currently have. We have the, the parent module has the database schema in it. Uh, we have the UI, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, PS REST is going to be doing uh, all of the common things related to REST. So this will set up a new endpoint and then I have some uh, common queries that are going to hit the database and retrie retrieve data that's kind of common along all the components. Uh, QMAN reviews and assigns tasks. The workflow manager executes the tasks. Uh, utilities, those are common PowerShell function things, not so much uh, REST. Um, and then alert and scheduler I'm, I'm working on, but uh, kind of got caught up in, in getting all the other components out. All right. So current issues, uh, I use Plaster to build all my modules. So um, I would love to, to talk to Mr. Marquette. Um, I can't run pester tests in app there. I don't know what's going on with that, but I'd love to ask you a couple questions. Um, additionally, dependent modules. So. Locally, that works fine, right? If I go in and edit my uh, module file and say, you know, install this module first before you install, you know, the module I'm trying to import or install. Um, but again, in, in App Bayer, it just hates me. So, um, love to talk about that. Logging again, uh, you can generate a, lo a lot of logging um, when you're kind of writing applications and determining, you know, what's a critical or uh, an error versus. Uh, something that's just benign, doesn't really matter. Um, documentation, uh, you know, how do I show people what this is, how to add a script to it, things like that. I feel like the PHP stuff I wrote is kind of intuitive, um, but I, I also sit with it every day. So, you know, getting feedback on, you know, how to write documentation that allows people to use my tools, right? Not just from a technical standpoint, but from like a functional standpoint. Uh, and then PHP loading. So, you know, you hit a page and it's, you know, a, a row of rec or a, lots of rows of records. It's going to load all of that up front and then, then kind of page it for you. I'd love for that to be like server side. So um, if anybody likes PHP, I'm, I'm open for it. The, uh, so, yeah, yeah. So like once you're on the page and it's loaded, you can go through the data sort, filter, everything, and it's super fast. It's just that initial load of like, 3,000 rows that might take 15, 20 seconds. Does it all refresh? No. So, um, dependencies, I have REST PS module that does all the uh, REST endpoints for PowerShell on the back end. The uh, PHP has built in REST. I found a, a module online that allows it. A single file will allow you uh, complete REST endpoints to all of your data. Um, and then the, the PowerShell login module I have there. All right. So looking ahead, uh, PowerShell 6, I haven't tested it, so if anybody has a Mac, I'd love for you to test it today. No? All right. Um, you do. Uh, Docker, I, I can definitely see Docker having uh, a play in this for uh, potentially the workflow manager aspect. Um, I, I'm not as versed on Docker as I'd, I'd, as, as I'd love to be. I definitely don't want to do Windows. Um, if, you, if you look at my blog, you'll see that I've talked about Windows and Docker and using Windows containers. It's cool, it's fun, uh, it, but it's bloated, it's large, it's heavy. Uh, uh, so the original problem I had was I was using that MySQL module and I couldn't get the DLL to load on Nano. So I was using the core, which 
is huge. And even Nano is big when, you, when you're talking about, um, does anybody know the current size of the PowerShell uh, Linux container? I mean, it's probably megs, maybe in the tens of megs versus gigs. So um, once I get to a point where I feel like everything's stable, I can kind of look at six and then look at, you know, making sure that the container would work. Um, as far as uh, visualizations, it's pretty, uh, pretty standard UI, right? I don't have graphs or uh, dashboards or anything like that. So I know there's a couple PowerShell projects out there. Um, and then, you know, looking at like Node.js or Angular, uh, I've looked at it. I, I don't like it. Um, and then security, right? I mean, eventually there will be security kind of baked in, but uh, I'm going to leave that to you guys right now. All right, demo time. So if you're running a laptop, pull it out, install these modules. You can trust me, I swear. Um, what I'd like to do is set you guys up as a, a, a workflow manager. I'll submit a bunch of tests, and they're really just going to run a, a, a return of one, or one, two, or three, or zero, one, two. Um, but I'll show you kind of the scalability and how easy it is to kind of get set up and running. Um, and while that is happening, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, did Mike Robbins come in? No? All right. So he was talking uh, earlier, and uh, he didn't know that Plaster would, you know, all of my functions are broken down into individual files, and he didn't know that during the deployment it could actually roll those up into a single module file. So looking looking at my uh, module in like VS Code. Can you all see this? Because they say to use this, and I find it to be really painful to look at. Um, so a bunch of different modules you'll see listed there. But when you go to the actual module installed on disk, everything is rolled up into a single file. And that is not the file I wanted. It was this one. So, oops, sorry. Yeah, so you're going to want uh, WMAN, PS REST, REST PS, that's not confusing, and utilities. And then depending upon your auto load, I don't know if it's, you know, putting it into administrator or whether, whether or not, but you should be able to import them. Um, let me validate my IP. No change, cool. All right. Making any progress? So that IP is my laptop. Right, so that's the purpose of the Pembroke PS module, right? That to me would be the top level module. Um, but I don't know that that would need to be installed on every box because I, I don't need, if, if I just have something out there that's, you know, executing tasks, I don't know that I need, like, the UI bundle to be on there and, and things like that. So, I mean, um, you can run all of them on the same box if you, you know, have a small environment or you're just kind of messing around. Um, but ideally, the, the idea is to kind of, you know, go horizontally. So, you know, each of the modules individually would have their own dependencies, and then if you want to do the full package, you could. So I'm open to questions and feedback too. Like it's, it's the whole idea is to be interactive. I've actually found it to be quite enjoyable to talk to different people leading up to the days, and it's actually kind of steered some of the, the stuff I've updated. Um, so that's been kind of nice. So the workflow manager is it specific to that particular 
No. No. So workflow uh, is, is really focused on the idea that um, you get to create your own. Um, so looking in here, I just have a few uh, sample tasks, right? And they, it, it's literally like two or three lines of PowerShell. Um, and it'll return you know, a pass task or a fail task. And the idea is that there's going to be a subtask that follows potentially. And you get to define, um, you know, if I run this script to reboot this VM or power this VM off and it succeeds, cool. Now I'm going to go remove it from inventory or clone it or whatever it is. But if I fail that task, well, then I'm going to provide, I'm going to do so something else. So you kind of get, get that, but you're getting it back in that visual form. Um, so when you actually come back in and look at the task status, um, you know, each of those individual tasks that, that you're defining are, are listed here. How are you defining those relationships between the tasks? As far as... So in, in the database, so coming in here, um, this will list out the tasks that are available for a pass, tasks that are available for a fail. Um, so you get to create that relationship. List of resources as far as Uh, so some of it was done organically, right? I had a problem I needed to solve. I don't know. Um, I definitely have stuff out on my blog that's, that would be specific to each area. Maybe not so much about database. Um, I kind of grew up, you know, doing Oracle-ish things, and then I was like, well, why can't I, you know, if I'm administering this database for, you know, a Java web app, why can't I turn around and use it for, you know, maintaining my data, my, you know, stuff that I need? So as far as Pembroke PS is concerned, it doesn't care, right? You get to define your script and your result inside of your script. The only thing that I'm going to capture is whether or not it completed correctly. So um, let, me, let me hop in the code real quick. I think that might make a little bit more sense. Um, so I, I do ship a couple uh, things with it, but again, it's not like useful in, in my mind, I mean, it's just, you know, basic scripts. So that's what, you know, these guys will be running it when they get it all set up. So, you know, here's a critical task. Um, I set the result and I return it, right? So whatever you want to perform from this script, you can do, and you get to pass in arguments to it. I, I don't care what those arguments are. I don't care what the script does. I'm just looking for when that script exits, I want a valid number. And if you don't give me a valid number, I give you an error, right? That's, that's what you see on the, uh, I think it was purple. So over here, it's going to say system error, right? You ran the script. Uh, the return was, was out of bounds. And I don't know what, I don't know what that was. You got it. Uh, so, uh, so talking about multi-tenant, I would assume that there might be a be able to have a SSL tunnel between the two, potentially. I mean, if they're on, if they're completely segregated and you can't pass traffic, two instances. Yeah, it, honestly, it's just REST messages. So, I mean, I mean, other than SSL to uh, the web UI, everything else is just talking REST in between. All right, you guys ready for the next thing, or you got errors? Uh, the other thing you might want to do is select a different number than one. So pick something between five and 30. So uh, 
I've manually put in information for the uh, workflow manager. So um, if you register one, it marks it as registered. So you can't mark two of them with the same component ID. Otherwise, it would be, you know, you have two instances running of the same software, which would be bad. Right. Is there uh, any thought to have more of a discovery from your machine out to what's in your environment? It, it could be, but I don't, how would my machine know? I mean, I'm not a Spring developer. I'm not a Java developer, right? So um, I, I don't, could I do it? Sure. But I would still have to have something on that box with, I guess, you know, my packages installed and running to know that when I hit this endpoint, this port, that now I want to register it. My thought process was I'm going to go out, stand, stand it up, do what they're doing right, install the modules, and then register, and, and I'm in. One thing that we have in our enterprise is we have 40, 50,000 devices we're monitoring, and I'm not touching 50,000 of them. So I don't, I don't want you to think that this is endpoint monitoring. Uh, think more task management, right? So you, you might have something, uh, so I, I might put a machine out there that needs to touch all 40,000 machines um, and get a piece of information. But that single machine is, is reporting back, right? That's, that's their workflow manager. And it's running a script. You can set how many concurrent tasks that it'll run. Um, and it'll go out and do the work for you. Okay. But I don't know that I'd want to Correct. Yes. Sorry. It is what they should be putting in. That's a something we're going to find out. <laughs> What's that? All right. But hey, error handling works. Um, so what IP do you have? What are you, what are you guys? Yeah. Oh, I may have given you the wrong one. Let's try 10, 12, 7, 40. That sounds a lot better. All right. I'm on a dark six, so I'm okay. This is the issue of having uh, like every. I'm 10, 12, dark six. That should be fine. Yeah, so, so the purpose of the, of the demo is going to be I'm running the queue manager. I'm going to submit a bunch of tasks, and then those tasks are going to be handed down to whoever is setting up their stuff down there. Um, and they'll see stuff kind of pop through and, and happen on their machine. You having any luck, or is it failing? You said you were 10. I'm 10, 12, 6, 138. Well, that's fantastic. So much for that demo. All right. Pretty fun. Yeah, I got a thing here and I've got a reply I've got a sixty three by two thirty seven by two thirty one that's twenty seven so it's starting to feel like a thing around the table. So much for trying new stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. How about I set it up and run it? Uh, I would say not that long because I had a lot of the pieces already between like all those individual like stovepipe things I've, I've been building over probably two or three years. Um, the problem is when you start looking at uh, trying to combine all of those to have like a common management layer and, and separating things out. So um, about two years ago, I wrote an a application. Um, anybody familiar with uh, Vester? So it's a command line tool that uses 
pester to validate VMware configuration. So, um, which is, again, great tool, command line's great. Um, the issue I have is having a junior guy that sits next to me, it's kind of like his work. So, but him running that for 40 different vCenters would be very time consuming. So, I, you know, took the opportunity, wrote a little uh, UI for it, and, uh, you know, he can just run through, run the tests, see the failures, and then, uh, you know, there is a remediate option. I don't, like I said, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but, you know, he can go through and just click remediate. It'll go and, and fix, switch the bit, whatever it is. So, you know, behind the scenes, it's running PowerShell, PowerCLI module, the Vester module, um, and then I'm just basically wrapping that as a whole. I'm not really kind of getting any hooks into that code. Um, but it kind of gives us a, a pretty good feeling in the morning when we come in. We can schedule this to run at night, and you know we'll we'll know whether or not something has any kind of config drift. Kinda. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's full DSC because um, desired state, ninety nine percent of the time you're going to say fix it. Um, maybe I don't know. I don't use DSC. Report it for sure. So, um, I, two different things in my mind, I, and I don't know what the right solution is. I think I, that community goes back and forth a little bit on it. I mean, it's, there's still some tools out there that they publish DSCs already. All right. Well, I was hopeful that the uh, network wouldn't be that bad. I figured that you would at least be able to uh, talk to things. Let's see. Five is not available. Did I put some in here or not? Do you know if uh, how is CLI is going to in any way interdo or maybe functional with core? Um, so they have a beta version of PowerCLI 10 out. Well, it's not beta anymore. It's official release. Have you met Kyle? <laughs> so Kyle is the, uh, uh, what's your title now? Technical marketing, Technical marketing for uh, uh, vSphere APIs. Um, so before I stick my foot in my mouth and say what versions are available and what's supported, um, he would be the, the one to kind of answer that. I'll, I'll be happy to re repeat it for the recording. Uh, it's 10.0 now. It's supported multi platform. So you're, you're ready to go to the next slide. Yeah. All right. So we use the 4.0 framework. All right, so when you start the workflow manager, there's gonna be a couple things that happen. Um, it's gonna start a process to actually, uh, you know, look at the queue and see whether or not there's, uh, what the status is. So right now I've registered it, but I haven't actually turned it on. Um, and then it's also gonna set up a REST endpoint. So I can actually go to another window that is hiding from me. So there it's running, so this one, this one, this one. There's four down. So that would shut it down. I actually just want to get a status. So I'm just getting a status back for myself. So the return was zero. I know that doesn't, I'm putting back the log messages too. Um, but I would just grab that, parse it for zero. Status is good. I can update something if I want to update something. Um, or maybe I wouldn't run a command if I was going to try to run a command. And then back in D3, 
the UI. I would start my guy up. So, so this workflow manager is, is just a process, essentially, that's running, and it's going to be able to perform tasks that get assigned to it. No, so currently uh, I'm polling the, the endpoint for the status. So uh, this process that is running down here. Nope, not that one. So I, so I call this my kicker process. It's sitting there running and basically holds the ID and knows where the REST server is and says, you know, is my component running? Should it be running? Should it be starting up? Um, and then I take action based on that. So when it's running, when it's down, I don't do anything. When it's shutting down, I don't do anything. The only time that this thing takes action is when I actually click the button to say start up. It sees that it starts up, and then it will kick off another process that actually performs the work. Are you doing like a do until? Yes. Okay. You got a timeout on it? Uh, no, there's no timeout. What, what, define what you mean by timeout. No, runs infinitely. So now it's up and running. And there's a queue manager. Queue manager, I think I already started. So he's line number one. So the reason you would see multiple, right? So I, had, I was talking earlier about that, like that management plane. So uh, I have the ability to send files to my workflow manager. So, you know, I don't know who it was talking about, you know, what scripts does it know to run? So most likely I'm going to have a central repository of scripts that I want to run in my environment. And I'll be able to um, take those and ship them across the wire to all my subordinate machines so that I can have that kind of uh, single panning of class of, uh, of files out there to, to synchronize. All right, what else do we got? All right. So now it's, gonna, it's just going to pick up tasks and uh, start running them. Um, I'm not sure. So this one just ran, system error. Yay. Um, some of them are actually designed to do that. Let me kick off a whole bunch. Always secure your environments. When did they move the little refresh from like the right to the left? All right, so it should churn through these pretty quick. Um, if there's an error, it will not submit a subtask, right? Because we ended in an in a unknown state. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they kind of fire off. Um, you can have different wait times for these guys. So uh, this wait time here is configurable. I'll have a button soon. I have an issue in for that. So you can actually change it. So this is how long the queue manager is going to wait before it goes through the uh, queue of tasks again. And the same thing can be configured on the workflow manager um, so that you can determine how long you want, want him to wait around um, before running more tasks. So I only have a 30 second wait right now. So it's pretty quick. You can start to see stuff kind of fire off. Um, max tasks, so that's going to be how many tasks that you can perform at the same time. Um, and that's going to be based on your system resources, right? So wherever you're deploying this thing, you know, if, if you're short on memory, you may not want to run that many tasks. Yeah. It will not run more. No. No. So I, I did get in Catch-22 where uh, I was configuring or I was assigning tasks. Um, and, and the way that it works is the workflow manager is then going to kick off a sub-process. Um, I don't use jobs, I don't use workflows, but um, the query was, was too fast. So I would create the process, wait for the modules to load in that sub-process, and during that time, I would kick off that same process again because the first step of that process after module load is to set the task as running. So I had to come up with like an intermediate stage to say, you were assigned, and then when I start you, you're actually going to go into a staged status so that it's not assigned anymore, so I don't start it again. 
So this is like back to the thing where I was like, I don't know how to document or explain how this thing works, right? Like that's, so the questions are awesome because I'm like, all right, well, I mean, I, I know how it works, but you know, what do all these different things mean to, to you guys? Like, does it make sense? Do you, do you see what's happening? It's still early on, right? So it's not like as polished as it probably should be. Um, you know, what's the feedback from you guys, the understanding of, of what I'm trying to accomplish, like in between all the other things that are going on in your environment? Are the watch logs stored locally on the server? Or? So today they're stored all on my laptop. Um, what I do in my environment is I would map a drive from all of my uh, workflow managers to a single share, whatever that share is. And then the web, ha web has access to the share and the workflow managers. So it writes to all the same location, and then I can read from that. No, because I'm usually just performing the task to the client. The client doesn't really care about me. Uh, so, you know, if I'm connecting into a vCenter or something, there's, I'm not preventing any of the normal logging. So it's going to know that I have a session open, and it's going to see the tasks. Um, I'm not pulling that. Uh, I have a process where I patch Windows machines, so I will pull, like, the WSUS log off the box or the Windows update that log, some different things off the box there. Um, and those can be displayed. Um, part of the, uh, that Vester implementation, I'll actually pull back uh, the XML. So with, with, you know, Pester or Vester, you can actually export the XML. So um, I don't know if I still have all these log files around. But yeah, I mean, it gives you the raw XML if you wanted to look at that. I don't know why you would want to, but it's there. Um, it could be useful, I guess. I mean, that's actually how I create the, uh, the, the rendering in the UI. UI. I actually parse through all the XML, get the stack traces out, bubble them up. Um, rather than doing pass through. And then uh, this is a pretty long run of stuff. So, you know, I'm logging stuff all along the way. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you're gonna see. Um, also built into this is uh, retries. So um, you get a max retry, right? Because if you have like a, a task that creates a subtask, um, you know, you could kind of get into an infinite loop, which would be potentially bad. So, you know, you can cap that at however many tasks you want to want to run. Um, I tend to run everything as administrator. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's a service account of, of you know. Uh, I think as long as the modules are available, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't run. Um, I was running into an issue, kind of troubleshooting some stuff last night, and uh, like this task window that comes up was living inside the module folder, and I couldn't execute that file, right? So I had a, I had a right to get it out. So the part of the registration is that it's gonna create basically a local directory, um, and it probably didn't make it there because you can't reach me, and I bomb out before that. Um, so it creates a directory for the workflow manager and the REST folder, copies those files out of the module onto the uh, C drive, and then I can execute things from there. So as long as the module has permission to run, I think it's going to be fine. How many actual services is this creating? So services as far as... Is it just creating a Windows server? No. 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 It's all just PowerShell. Um, I, there was a time where I was thinking about like compiling the PowerShell and running it as a service. Um, I decided just to go with REST, and that's why I provide a REST endpoint for the workflow manager. So any kind of information you want to get from that workflow manager, you just hit it with a REST endpoint. You can write the check. You can whatever you want to do. So that makes it completely agentless, right? No, I mean, agentless would would be I can inspect the VM, like capturing SNMP traps, or right. I'm, I'm kind of inspecting it from the outside based on the information that it's kind of pushing out. I mean, there, there is something running on the box. Yeah.
Um, so let me shut this guy off so it stops popping stuff up in our face, because that's no fun. Um, all right, right, so I just click stop, right? Um, so that was one thing I, I struggled with at the beginning. I'm like, how can I get a UI to like take action? Um, and the short answer I have for, uh, for this is that this process here, the, the kicker guy, I don't really have a better name for it. Um, he's constantly watching that table in that database with the component ID. So this is workflow manager ID one. So he's looking at the row in the database and seeing what the status is. Based on that status, he can take action. So. He is listening on a port. <laughs> so this is, so like part of the problem with the service, right, if I can't get the service to start up is that I have no uh, view into the box to do, to take any action, right, other than potentially Windows remoting, which is, which is an issue, right? So I'm taking a tool, dual approach to this. I have a process running on box that I started, and then I have a REST endpoint. So in theory, I can hit the REST endpoint and kill that process to update the modules. Right, so now I don't have to ever log into this box again so long as it doesn't get rebooted, right? And that's probably where a service might be better. But, all right, I, I mean, I'm open to, open to ideas, but in theory, I can tell this REST endpoint to go get all the new modules, new files, tell it to shut down the kicker process, and then restart it. Pulls in all the new modules. That process can then kill the REST endpoint and start the REST endpoint back up so the REST endpoint gets all the new modules. Did I ever tell you that I'm not really a developer? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that there are plenty of solutions out there, but part of the, the draw for me was that none of this is compiled. So debugging it, messing with it, it's, I can do whatever I want whenever I want. Not that you should, but I, I don't have to compile anything, right? I, I just run it. I can deploy stuff. I mean. The speed at which I can deploy, deploy things to all my workflow managers um, without having to compile and restart processes is huge. Um, the, the REST PS module, I'm still getting back to the, the question we had before. So in the, uh, the kicker guy, oh man. Does anybody actually use the white stuff, like this, this format, like working at their computer? Like I, this is painful. Only for presentations, all right. So, I mean, here's a pretty quick little check, right? So the workflow manager status equals one, one is down. This kicker isn't gonna do anything. It just sits there and goes through the next process. There's actually a wait at the bottom for that that we captured earlier. If it's two, it's running. I don't need this thing to do anything. It's only when it's three is, is when I'm actually gonna take action and do something. And at that point, that's when I'm gonna go invoke a new console, pop open the, uh, the process, and then start the REST endpoint. Well, no, the REST endpoint's already run at this point. So does that make, make sense? Um, there, you could and you can, using curl through PHP, hit a button and send a command to this endpoint over here that's actually listening. So this guy's actually sitting here listening, waiting for somebody to send it, send it a command. So, I mean, that's how quick it is. Now, I'm, I'm not doing anything meaningful here. I'm just literally returning a zero for a status. But um, if the endpoint was down, you would, you would get an error. So it's pretty quick and easy. Um, like I say, the, the ones I have for VMware standing up um, and having an open session are, are super useful because I don't have to worry about going through the login process if I want to kind of loop through 40 different vCenters. My, my process now is just to loop through all 40 endpoints and get the information I need. So. So that's okay. You actually your REST endpoint to start it off. Maybe you'll have some plans going through that. To do REST endpoints in PowerShell? I mean, that's what this is. So, so. Yeah, you want to see it? Yeah. It's in the. So the the module is uh, REST PS. I think I don't know how to open here. Um, 
what's on it. I don't think I need it. Is there a way you can just add a folder? Like to your already open folder? Ah, God damn it. Where were you like two seconds ago? All right. All right, so the way that this works, um, it sets up a HTTP listener on the port that you describe. You can, of course, do SSL if you would like to. Um, I don't, I'm in a lab, I don't like security. Um, and the big thing to kind of take out of this is there's a file that lists the routes. Um, so when you deploy the endpoint, it's looking at this file to define the routes. And the routes meaning what script you want to run. Um, it could be a script block. It doesn't have to be um, a, a script per se. So you can also pass in arguments um, just like you would a regular endpoint. It's your job in your script to then parse the arguments further. So um, there's a lot of files here, but the, the line to actually start this is pretty simple. So I'll even you know, do a default port, but download the module and then run that. And it'll just set up an HTTP listener that can run any script that you define to it. The beauty of um, what I've done with that available routes file is that if you update that and end or add a script, uh, every time I auto load that. So you don't have to shut the endpoint down to get a new function. Does that make sense? Could the representation of that be your module or can you share uh, it? It's out in the gallery. It's, it, I wrote it. Uh, I took a combination of two different packages that people had out there. There's one guy who kind of routed to different web pages. Um, and then there was another one who executed scripts, but it was uh, fire and forget. So like you wouldn't get a return back other than uh, whether or not you selected an, a, a correct route. Like if the route's not available, you'll get, a, you'll get an error. Um, but this guy kind of held on to the return. So it's like I kind of pulled the two together because they were like very different code bases. Um, but I kind of took the best of both worlds that worked best for me. Um, so, you know, if you fire off something, that's not what I want. Working on a laptop kind of sucks too. All right, let me move it to where you can actually see it. All right, so this is just checking the status, right? Pretty normal endpoint, nothing too fancy. Um, if I change this and add, add anything to it, I'm gonna get back that there's no matching routes. So the endpoint doesn't take any action on, on some unknown location or unknown path. Um, and then there's, I can, I can shut it down, so. And, and that's a common one. It doesn't matter what method you send at it, when you do endpoint shutdown, it's gonna, it's gonna shut it down. So that window should have gone away, and it did. And so one nice thing is that this process, where'd he go? So this guy will actually start it back up. So this is, I shut down the workflow manager endpoint, and his job is to actually start it back up when it's down. So that's kind of the service aspect of it. Still making sense? You think that, I mean, do you, I love this module because it's, it's great, right? Take the security or lack of security out of it and it kind of makes you a, a little scared. But as far as like getting information off a box or, or a box that's performing tasks, it's fantastic. Um, it really lets me kind of distribute, uh, I don't wanna say workloads, but um, for the VMware stuff, like it's been lifesaver. Um, so this would be because I'm trying to retrieve information as fast as possible, right? So if, if you had 40 vCenters in, in your environment and you needed to uh, validate whether a uh, port group existed, all of them are different uh, logons, how would you instrument it, right? You'd probably do a loop, 
like give me the vCenter, get the username and password, and loop through. Um, that's a long, it's, just, it's a time consuming process. So I can take one of these endpoints for each of those 40 vCenters, stand it up, and now all I have to do is hit an endpoint, tell it what information I want. The account you started off with. Yeah, exactly. So, you're the administrator. so uh, I, I'm not an ethical hacker, right? So, sure. I don't know. I don't know what you could gain access to other than over the HTTP port, right? You you expose that. But as far as the things that's going to execute, it's only going to execute what is in the routes file. Everything else you're going to get from me is going to be no routes available, okay. right? So that's that's what I was kind of trying to show here. So, you know, status is available. I'm going to get a valid return back. Um, but anything else is not exposed to the to return information back to the endpoint. Right. Right. So. Yep, hang on one second. <laughs> That's, I said a disclaimer at the beginning, man. Like security is, uh, So here's the uh, endpoint file for uh, that specific guy. So, um, yeah. So the other option I have is self-test, right? So I just put these in as placeholders for you know get, put, post, delete. So the other command I could run would be self-test. Cool. Still returns back zero. Um, if I go in here and change this to, I'll just keep it a get to make it simple. God damn it. Um, picks it up on the fly. So that's super nice too, as far as like a deployment. Right, I don't, I don't have to worry about shutting the endpoint down, restarting it, just to pick up a new file that you know, has a minor change or you know, is, is a new addition because I want to be able to get different data off the box. Do you want to see more for, I mean, you have any questions about what it's doing or how it's doing it? Yeah, so there's some weird stuff going on um, with capturing uh, the, the string that's coming in. So I kind of split it. Um, and let's see. So when it comes in, I will, where'd it go? I split the URL that's basically passed in. So using HTTP listener, they're coming in on a, on a URL it takes that entire URL and I can split that based on what they've requested. Um, split it on the question mark, just like a regular endpoint would be. And then it would be your job to do like the ampersands yeah. after that. Um, so I don't know, I don't have anything running on this that would take it, but I don't know that it would throw an error other than I'm curious to see what the output would be here. 
Yeah, so it didn't, it returned zero, but it didn't, uh, you can see, so it like cut off the arguments or whatever you would, you would call that for the endpoint. So it like stripped off my hello world um, and put it into the argument. So that would get passed to my PowerShell script as an argument. I would split it based on the equal sign and do whatever thing I wanted to do. So you would, you would define that in, in your available routes, right? So I, I mean, I've set all these up to run the same script. Okay, so the script is not a layer. No, like we're. So you wouldn't use the same script for all of them. Correct, yeah. This was just, I don't, to, to write something to post would be, you know, like you're, yeah. I mean, I guess I could put it, you know, for an example right in here to like stop a process, but I really don't want to be destructive on someone's box when they're like, oh, let me stop, you know, the workstation service. <laughs> this thing doesn't work, right? Or maybe it does. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't actually pass the, the method into the script because I, I'm assuming the management on the front end is actually taking care of that. And by assuming, meaning like I wrote it, it's, it's not going to execute a get script if you specify a put. Like I don't have to figure that out. So if, if it rebooted at this, at this point in time, there's nothing that would start it automatically on the box. Um, not to say that something couldn't be added for that. Uh, I question what that would be. I don't know if that's a run once. I don't know if that's adding it as a service. Um, I haven't really found too many clean ways to do like PowerShell scripts running as a service. It seems kind of hokey to me, right? I gotta probably get some executable that's gonna just be in a path that has an argument for the script. Does anybody do that now? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I think there's maybe modules for you know, setting up scripts to run as services, but you have, you have scheduled tasks that could run on startup as a user. Okay. There's some scripts in there you can set up to, to run that. Yeah, so I mean, that would be the other thing. Like, I'd, I'd have to log in, most likely, right? Unless you have auto login. We don't need to talk about security. Um, so at some point, like I'm gonna, if the if the machine reboots, the the idea would be that I have something monitoring the status. I would see that um, the endpoint's no longer running, and then I would want to go out and figure out why my workflow manager, the thing that's going to be performing tasks, isn't doing anything. And then you know I could log into it, start the process, and carry on about my business. So if it's registered and you start the process, it'll reconnect and update its status. Does that make sense? You want to see it? Like, okay. All right, so let's just go with the fact that like the process ended, right? So the, the endpoint is still up and I just kill the process, right? So the WMAN process is no longer running. Right, it, it had the title WMAN ID, whatever. Um, so I disagree with myself a little bit because which guy? Oh no, that's a ta that's a task manager. All right, that's the queue manager. I was wondering what that was for a second. I haven't put host titles on everything yet. What's that? No one hears it but you. <laughs> All right, so it's, the machine is already registered as a workflow manager to the system, so I'm just taking the startup uh, line and starts it right back up and it's good to go. It'll capture what the status is. I think the only thing that I'll say it wouldn't do right now is if, if both the kicker process and the actual workflow manager, the one who's actually performing the tasks, if they both 
die and I just restart the process and the current status was running, it would not start a new process. It would, be, it would kind of be hanging out there and running. So that's something I would need to kind of figure out. Um, maybe? Yeah, I don't think, because I think if the status is running, I don't actually perform any, I don't validate that it is running. I probably should add something for that. Does that make sense? Because currently, if, uh, if the endpoint's not running, I'm looking for a PowerShell console window with that name. And if, it, if I don't find that, I start the endpoint up. So I probably could do a little bit better job of handling the actual workflow manager process that is running. Am I crazy? <laughs> No, I mean, that's, that's what this is for. So, I, like, um, what? Yes. Yeah, so from, from a high level, I have the database is installed on my box. I'm running the web on my box, which is just, I'm using WAMP. Um, and then I'm also running the workflow manager and the queue manager separate console windows, right? So uh, so the vCenters would, would be on the outside. So they're, they're tangential, right? They're further out, right? So I don't, I don't care what you're connecting to, what scripts you're running to. All I care is that when you run that script, whatever it does, it reports back information, right? And then we can capture that information however you want. Right, so, um, you know, getting into like the, the Vester, Vester kind of stuff, um, it's, this table is set up a little bit differently for results, um, but, but the concept is the same, right? I run a test um, and I capture all the information about the cluster, the host, whatever it is, um, but the process, the management process only cares that the test was sent out, the workflow manager ran the test, and sent back all the result information. It doesn't actually care about the vCenter I'm connecting to. The data is stored. I store all that data in here. So you'll see that I have uh, targets. So targets being whatever you would want. I have target types. So you can define what the thing is that you're trying to run something against. But I'm not trying to limit anybody as to what you can run against. Um, additionally, there's the, the concept of uh, parent targets. So if I have a system with five vCenters, I could say, you know, run this check against production, and then it would split that out into five different tasks. And then the, the parent task is, re is related to the child tasks. Does that make, make sense? Um, and that's at a task level and at a, uh, a target level. So you can kind of group things together a little bit. Um, also with the retries, you can, you, the retries will be linked as well through a different table. So getting into those details gets really confusing. Uh, which, so you're talking about like when I was talking about having the 40 endpoints stood up? Yeah. If that process dies, um, I have a process that's looking for the endpoint getting that status. And if I see that that status is not running, I will start up another endpoint for that vCenter. Yeah. Right, so the, so the connection would break. As soon as the connection breaks, the endpoint probably will go away because it can no longer maintain that connection. So if it's running on port 8080, um, that endpoint would drop off. I have, I have a process that I'm running, right, as a scheduled task to say every five minutes, go check all the endpoints that are available, right? And if it sees that one isn't there, I send a command to, I know you're gonna kill me, right? A management endpoint that's sitting on the box that says, all right, now start up an endpoint for this vCenter on 8080. Is that? Rest. 
Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm using REST because, uh, like I say, I, I didn't grow up using PowerShell remoting because I've, I've been in the VMware world. So to me, I use PowerShell as just a programming language to, to interact with other services that are out there. So it's, it, you absolutely could. No, no, it's just like, unfortunately that's like, right now would be the manual kind of piece. So uh, I don't have it currently for what I wanted to do with the demo and clearly that worked out re very well because um, I didn't want people actually mapping my drive. Um, but I think it's- I'm just kind of curious, like from a, from a service center perspective, um, having something that's a bit more on-demand that's really frequent, um, would you yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, th like this is why I'm working on this, right? So at, at my place of work, I, I have multiple of these that handle different tasks within my infrastructure, and it's a pain in the ass to manage five different stacks of things that uh, all touch the same target set. So I'm, I'm performing different tasks on the same equipment. Um, and it, it was really just a matter of, well, I didn't know I needed to do that, I've written that code, I wanna stay away from that code, so let me rewrite it and get it better, right? I mean, over the course of, the, the, of time, your, your coding is gonna get better, um, and you, you may shy away from stuff you've previously written. Um, so what I decided, uh, I, I don't know how, how many months ago, I was like, I'm gonna rebuild this one more time, and that's it. Um, and it's painful because before, uh, the original one I wrote was a task manager and it would go through and uh, I work on an automated testing system for, uh, in a VMware environment. So we send machines out there, we, we allow users to, to submit their tests and sometimes those machines just crash and burn. Um, and my Java application doesn't always clean it up nicely. So I have something that can go out there and clean it up for them. Uh, the issue was it only had a queue manager. That queue manager would kick off four tasks. So I had no scalability, right? So the next iteration, I had a queue manager that could manage the tasks and just assign it out to a workflow manager to which I could have as many as I wanted. So, you know, the evolution of it is, is kind of what it, where it's at now. And I, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, and, and trying to understand whether or not people can actually use it other than myself because I don't use Windows remoting and I'm, I'm not on a domain and you know, it's, a, it's a different solution potentially, but it can reach any service that's out there. So um, as far as the map drives go, I mean, that could be an endpoint check. You could you know, determine whether or not the drive was there, how much space is on the drive and report that back. Um, you know, as far as the task result, this page that is here, um, my plan for this would be I'm going to, uh, for specifically for Esther UI, which is the Vester UI, I'll have a basic task here, but all that result information is gonna be stored in a different table. Like I don't need test results to be munged together with the actual task running itself. Let me know the task ran good, and then I can go over here and look at results of the tests. It's really just gonna be logging. Okay, so if you were to say something else or something else already, you just send logs into that instead of your shared instance. Yeah, I mean the only advantage I have is that I can actually view the logs in here. So that's the one, go away Dell. Um, where is it, okay, maybe I don't have those logs displayed yet. Um, but for like the queue manager and stuff, it's nice to be able to actually view the log while it's running or you know, be able to troubleshoot. You'd have to refresh to get the, the newest yeah. information, but having those logs available to say, well, this task failed and here's, here's why, or you know, whatever those, those cases might be. Um, I don't know how easy it would be to you know, 
I have the task ID, so if, if I've done logging properly, I could you know send a message to Elk to say or Splunk and say, you know, package, you know, I don't know if it would be like an like an iframe or or what the I'm not exactly up on like all of the terminology. So, so. I mean, it's like Elk's got well, Elk's got a huge API as well, so you have to do it through like query. So if you're going to compile some things together, like query through mm -hmm. the API. API. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and you know, for the endpoints too, you can actually. Uh, that makes me think like it, it is just a REST server. So, um, yeah, let's not do shutdown. Let's. Uh, which one was it? This one. So, from a web browser, you'd get kind of what you would expect as well. Nope, I don't need all that. So you get back a JSON response just like you would expect from the endpoint. So um, I think the only thing I probably don't do very well with that module is you're not getting like the 200 back. So if you even if you were to do a, a web request versus the REST method, you wouldn't you wouldn't get a status back. So I think that's probably something I need to kind of add in there. Instead of you know sending back the invalid route, send back a 404 or something along those lines. Uh, so the probably the first one. So the first time this ever really came to came up was at a, a VMworld hackathon back in like August of 2016. Um, we were working on, uh, the team was working on uh, basically CM for NSX. And I was like, what if I just like wrote up a UI for it, right? Like instead of, you know, instead of seeing something like, uh, did I get away from it? Give me one second. You know, instead of seeing command line stuff, right, when you're talking about looking at more than one item at a time, you know, it, it's difficult to, to kind of put all that together in your mind. So, right, so, Trying to capture like this kind of information into something that's usable is kind of what the goal was, right? They were working on the actual checks, and I was working on like the visualization of it. Um, because I mean, this is great if you're like working on a single project, but if you're running this, and I'm using, I'm not VPN in or to anything, so I can't actually run the Vester check. But if I can turn this output. Right, that's also XML into something that you can actually consume um, or a junior guy could consume, it's gonna be a lot more valuable, right? Same information, I just get an option to display it. Um, I can, you know, I was sorting there, I can filter on fail. So um, it's all kind of built in and easy. Like I'm, like I said, I'm not a web developer, so I'm sorry, this is what you get right now. Someone wants to pick up Angular. I'm, I'm more than happy. Like I say, all the data is available from the database via REST. So, um, so I'll say it probably started two years ago, but that's when I started doing like those those stove pipes. Um, and then uh, last year, probably around this time frame, I wrote one that was uh, included like the deployment of multiple work managers and got the queuing and all that kind of stuff figured out. Um, I've been running that for a while at, at work, um, but even that was very specific to the tasks I was trying to accomplish. Um, and then I don't know exactly when I started putting all of this stuff because I didn't check stuff in immediately. So all the commits are probably from like the last four or five months. Um, all the codes in GitHub, it's published to the gallery. Uh, 
100% pester testing on, on anything that I've published past the script analyzer. Um, doesn't mean it works. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it's been tested, everything, you know, as long as you have connection, it works. So, and apparently it doesn't work on PowerShell 6. Yes. It's an implementation, you, you gotta get that R, uh, what was that module? I oh, know that was for Windows PowerShell, damn. Yeah, yeah, right, so I don't wanna run a command if I can't actually validate that the REST server is available. So, single ping, if you're good, then I'll start trying to interact with you. Nothing too fancy. Got a lot of people looking like glazed over. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. It's a lot to take in. Like, that's what I tell my guys when I kind of, you know, implement something new for it. Um, but it's, it's not doing anything different than what you would do in your head, right? Just visualizing what a computer needs to do for you is, is the tricky part, right? At least that's what I try to tell my people when I'm, you know, going through like logic and, and how to get things started. Um, WAMP comes in a package, so I didn't have to worry about configuring anything. Um, the PHP, package that I use, it's a single file, so uh, it'll work with MySQL, SQLite, uh, MS SQL, so whatever database you wanna hook it up to is fine. Um, it's just PHP, so if you wanna run it on IIS, feel free. Um, but I mean, it's just PHP and it just connects to a database. So um, there's, there's nothing saying you have to use WAMP or not. I mean, I, I don't need, you know, whatever you guys need time-wise, I mean, we're, we're good, we can wrap up, we can poke around more, it's up to you guys. Do you have schedules for everything? I'm sorry? Do you have individual schedules for, for groups? Or? It, for groups as far, uh, like groups of targets? So I don't have the scheduling piece in this yet. I use it at work, but it is a different schema, like I have to kind of, redo the data, so you have the data layer that you know defines how I store the data in the database, and that's directly how the, the PowerShell is written. Um, and some of my stuff still uses uh, this Power WAMP module I have, which accesses the data directly, so I need to convert that over to use just REST. So I don't want, like it's, I haven't migrated that yet. So, but I mean the thought process would be there's uh, going to be a table of available scheduled tasks and I will review them like a queue manager and if the things line up I will submit the task the queue manager will then assign the task and the work will get done and that way it's not stored on a single machine for you know and you, I could, you know because it's setting up as a queue manager you could actually have multiple schedulers sitting out there for you know different reasons, I don't, I don't know the value in that maybe, I don't. Um, these, these plus features like priority or? Yes, absolutely. So priority is taken into account. So, ta nope, target types, I want task types. So priority is there, it's configurable. So the queue manager will assign them by priority so when, it, when I do the query, it's you know giving me everything back in a list in ascending order based on priority. It'll assign those out, and then the workflow manager. In theory, the workflow manager, if it you know has a max of four tasks, it should never get four more than four. Um, but I'll still start them by priority if all four of them get assigned at the same time. And you can have the same priority level as well. It's not going to hurt it. Script. Yep. Yes. To like to actually click through here or.
So I mean, it would be as simple as adding it in like this. Uh, one thing about PHP is you got to do double slash. I, I don't, doesn't want to escape it, I don't know. So it, it adds it in as an availability. And you could then submit a new task. So from a target, I will go in, submit a new task. It's not there, so I haven't set it up to say that this target can run this task, or this, a task can run against a specific target. So I would have to go into here, nope, and add a new one of these to say the target type is a system, and I can add 2018 to it, and here's where that max retry, uh, you know, two. Adds it in there. And now it's available. So I would I can submit it from here. The queue manager would pick it up, assign it out, run it. What's, what's the default determination of when it runs again? Is that that five minute interval? Or? So you would be able to configure to a degree um, how fast it how fast the queue manager is checking the queue for something new. So like I have this one set for 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, I'm gonna run through and determine whether or not there's any, any tasks in the queue that are submitted or queued, right? So I have submitted because I might wanna triage something. I don't have any code in there right now, but to me, um, this submitted is, is potentially valuable in the future. So I'll go through, I look at anything that's submitted, I flip it to queued. Once it's queued, I look to see whether or not a task manager has an availability so I only select a task manager that's not at, the, at its max, and then I'll assign that to that workflow manager. The workflow manager comes through and sees that it has a new task assigned, starts the process. When the process is complete, what is the It'll be complete. I'm assuming at some point it automatically flips back to submitted. Is that after the next 30 seconds is up? Because that's how it is. So tasks uh, can only have a single status. So like the workflow for a task would be I submit it, it gets queued, it gets assigned. Um, and then it would get, it would go running. Well, actually it goes staged, running, and then complete. And then there's no other option at that point. So the, the task is just one and done. It, the queue manager is looking for it. Um, the only other thing would be you could rerun it. So if it failed, you can just hit the rerun It'll hide that record and creates a new one, which is going to be like on five different pages from here. So this was just submitted from the previous screen. So it might be easier to see from uh, if I do that summit 2018 one. So your, your question on this one. So this is back to the Vester implementation. Yes. Did you have to go by and say, to do this, to allow that, and then make statements that way? Because we don't know what you're expecting when you use the code. Uh, so what I would say is uh, use at your own risk, right? It depends on what the configuration is. Um, so Vester will flip the bid on whatever function or whatever feature it is. Um, so. I just, I just feel like in my job where you know, can't do anything if you're not going to buy it. So you just go for it, do it. Right, so that's why it's an option. Yeah. And, and, the, and the idea would be that you know, this is really uh, a configuration that's bad. This isn't something new, right? You expect that your vCenter is going to be configured with this configuration, right? Whether it be a NTP server or uh, you know, DRS enabled, disabled, whatever those settings are, and this would be like out of line. That's what this is reporting. Does that make sense? So, I, um, yeah, or, you know, you'd have to use caution with remediate, but the hope is that it's not, it's a non-breaking change. So uh, for the rest endpoint on the clients, uh, 
right now everything's just set up to use HTTP, so no authentication. I, I did that on purpose. You can implement SSL. Um, same thing with the web side, right? So the web, on the web side of it, you have Apache. You can secure it for whatever would meet your, your environment's requirements, right? Like I don't want to push security on you and you should be doing X, Y, Z. You have the option. I, I don't. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not stopping it. Um, but for like demo purposes on a network where you could actually reach me, I didn't want to try and handle SSL. Right? Because he would need a certificate and match my chain. We would have to accept each other and like each other. So for, for REST, you're probably going to use some kind of like JSON token. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you would, you would want to set that up through the REST API, right, through Apache or whatever is serving out your, your web instance for this. Um, and then on the endpoints, you would probably be doing a certificate as well as a, uh, you, you could do a token piece. I don't know how that would, I haven't gotten that far into that. So. Um, I'm being asked to leave. So, thanks, you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Feedback.